Hi, everyone. This is Meredith Leindecker, director of Tally Dunn Gallery, coming to you from my living room. And while I wish I was at the gallery with our wonderful guest, Ted Kincaid, I'm so happy to see his face over Zoom and talk to him today. Um, Ted, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Good, good. Well, it's great to see your face. And um, I'm so excited to just talk to you about your new work and what's going on. And um, as everybody can see behind you is one of your beautiful pieces that we featured recently in one of our um, summer exhibitions called Daydreaming. We had a great group show with Ted's work and um, work by Rachel Perry and Sharon Kaur. Um, so maybe we could start out by Ted, if you wanna tell us and give us just a little bit of an overview about um, your new work and what's going on in the studio. Absolutely. Uh, the work that was featured in Daydreaming um, was sort of the culmination of a very long journey that I started many years ago when um, I started taking my own photographs of clouds and digitally dissecting them absolutely to their basic elements and then stitched them back together in an entirely different order. And that occupied my time for many years because I was very intrigued with the fact that clouds are much the way we look at all visual art in that we bring our own wealth of experiences to them. And so what we see in them varies according to our life journey. And you and I could walk outside and you, we could look up at the clouds and you could see Abraham Lincoln and I could see a bunny. And it really just depends on, you know, us as ourselves and individuals. So the clouds were a really interesting conceptual concept to see what I could do with that. And I kind of laid that to rest about six or seven years ago because I started feeling that I was repeating myself. But the thing that made me want to be an artist in the first place is going to museums and looking at these artists that were able to concoct a reality that stunned me to my core. And the thought of that, I was actually at the Kimball in Fort Worth in front of uh, Giovanni Bellini's Christ's Blessing and realized that those skies and all of these works that I was looking at were actually the major influence on my decision to become a visual artist. And the idea popped into my head that if I was able to digitally dissect the skies in my own photographs, why could I not digitally dissect the skies in the works of these other artists? And it opened, I mean, it, it, was, it was a light bulb. It was an enormous light bulb that went on uh, in my head. And the first piece I did was based on the Bellini and the Kimball. Uh, once I did that, it led me down a whole different path because I was working with two primary genres of painting that I was pulling uh, skies from. And it was the Italian Renaissance and it was the Northern Renaissance. And I was looking at both um, Venetian, in particular Venetian painters like Bellini, and I was looking at Van Eyck um, up in um, Flanders for the Northern Renaissance. And I realized, and it was something that in my many years as an artist, I still assumed that these painters concocted these skyscapes. But I realized, having traveled there, that they were painting what they saw outside and light reacts so dramatically differently in different areas. We talk about the light in Santa Fe or the light um, in the Northeast or in Provincetown. And you realize these artists were astute observers of light and what was happening with light and how it struck an object. And I noticed the profound difference between the light that the Venetians saw and the light that the artist of Flanders saw. And it really intrigued me. And so I started looking more and more. And this work that was in daydreaming really fell um, on the work of the Hudson River painters, uh, in particular Thomas Cole. And the painting behind me is um, uh, Fantasia on clouds based on Thomas Cole's Oxbow painting. And those colors, when you are in these locations, are exactly what you see. And it fascinated me. 
because we tend to, I mean, we tend to think of, of these artists from the past drawing more from their imagination, but what these pieces made me realize is they were far more astute, observant, and patient with looking to really see what was outside their doors or in front of them as they painted. Mm, that's so interesting. And did you find when you were kind of, you had this light bulb go off and, you know, you had, you had worked with clouds in the past and then was it seeing these paintings and really revisiting these um, master paintings that kind of inspired you to revisit the cloud form, I guess? Yeah, it, it really did because I started playing initially with just the color palette that the artist captured and a cloud composition. However, they, like every great painting, you can't take a section of it and make it work apart from the rest. Right. Um, decisions have to be made, the color balance, the feeling. And so I started bringing the landscape in. Mm -hmm. And bringing the landscape in is what I realized is that genius balancing of composition and color. So the clouds are my construction based on um, the color palette of, in this one, Thomas Cole. Um, the landscape is a Fantasia based on the actual landscape that's in the painting. Right. So it, it's a really, it's, it, the, the closest thing that I could compare my method of working in this body of work to is sampling in music. Um, mm -hmm. I am taking small samples and really doing something radically different with those. Right, right. And I think um, one thing that's really interesting for me at least to note is that, you know, so much of your work has been as a photographer on paper, um, and these works are printed on canvas, and they yes. are unique. They're not additioned, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's, it goes back to the fact that in, in art, we tend to build a hierarchy. And for many years, photography was like one level above macrame. And then you get to, you know, sculpture, painting, and you, you go up the ladder about what was real art. And a painting is a concept. It's not wet paint on canvas. It is a concept of working. It's a concept of building up. A photograph captures an instant. A painting captures a process. Mm. and decisions are made right. and I'm doing those digitally but if you watched me construct these it's absolutely identical to picking up paint adding looking responding um, when something doesn't work we have to change it and we can do that in photography but photography still the whole concept of photography is photography is about capturing reality Mm -hmm. And photography has, in a large way, distorted the way that we think we see. Painting is a much more accurate method of capturing how we process information. We right. process it in our brains in bits and pieces, and we rebuild what we're seeing in our brain. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for me that these things be seen as painting. And for many years, I was very unsatisfied with the technology to be able to realize these pieces on canvas. So I never produced them on canvas. Uh, I produced them on paper. But finally, the technology caught up to the fact that I was very comfortable both with the absolute um, physical feel of being in the presence of it, as well as the archivability of the process. And so I was finally comfortable and it's very important that they be on canvas because they are paintings to me and I want them to be seen as paintings. And especially conceptually, since what I've been doing for the past almost 30 years has been questioning the veracity of the photographic image, it expands the idea to what is a, what is a more accurate depiction of reality? What is a more accurate depiction of how we actually absorb information in the world? And paintings still, you know, we, we, we've heard painting declared to be dead for hundreds of years. <laughs> and somehow it still manages to be there as something that speaks to us in a way that frankly, photography can't do. And my journey as an artist 
um, especially someone who's worked in all mediums and is trained in all mediums, um, finding out what photography can do and even more importantly, what it can't. Mm -hmm. And we still tend to accept photographs as reality, even in this age of digital manipulation and even in the fact that my work previous to this was the appearance of a real photograph and in fact, totally manufactured. Right, right. And I think a, a really another interesting point for me is when you say you construct these images, I mean, it, you are literally building them pixel by pixel almost, right? And in, in yes. Photoshop or whatever program you're using. And that has to be incredibly time consuming, especially, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a form of painting just in a different way. Very much. I mean, there is a palette on my screen. There are brushes on my screen and I am doing the exact process of building an image in the way that a painter does. And honestly, I think it's, very, it's for, you know, in the art world, we always try to figure out who is the most adventurous and who is willing to take the most risks. And I find it odd that in the art world sometimes that people look at this as somehow, oh, well, it's digital, so it doesn't involve the same creative process. It does in, in, in every single way. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, I, I think that's a really important thing that sometimes people forget. And um, for me, it just, it gives your work such a richness. I mean, it's already rich and vibrant and beautiful, but um, when you start to hear these things that you're saying, I mean, it just gives it a whole different level of meaning for me, at least. Thank um, you. And, you know, I know you talked about Thomas Cole and um, others. Are there any other like big um, art historical influences that you're really revisiting, not on a constant basis, but just like that are always maybe in the back of your mind that are really important to you when you're making work? Very much so. Um, there's almost an infinite list of them and it really depends on what we're talking about because I, my method of working, um, I have many different ideas in my head, although the concept behind them remains constant, the aesthetic can vary quite a bit. And I go through this creative process where I work on very disparate bodies of work and then throughout the course, these things start coming together and they may start interweaving and going apart again. I really had, you know, for years it took me To gain, to gain confidence, the fact of looking at somebody like Gerhard Richter, who carries on two very different aesthetic bodies that somehow inform each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking at his work very closely and for a very long period of time made me, gave me the confidence to do this and know that I can have five different projects going on in the studio and a couple of them might be able to actually come out of the studio. Other ones will just stay there and inform other bodies of work. But it brings me to the, what, the question you asked. And there are musicians that are very influential to me that I come back to over and over. Max Richter, who is a classical musician that is sampling scores, not digital samples of sound, but sampling scores, ripping them apart, pulling them back together in a different order. There's also Ryuichi Sakamoto, who over the course of his long career was one of the pioneers of electronic music. But as we became aware of the good things that technology can give us and the very bad things that technology can take us down the road of, his music has changed very much. And my work has changed very much as well. In terms of visual artists, obviously the artists I've been talking about um, uh, that have influenced this work and other work, but um, I have been obsessed with both um, Walt Whitman. Mm. In fact, I've, I've gone through a very long period of analyzing Whitman's work and um, thinking about the fact that he was so prophetic and so profound and so way ahead of his time. And another artist that is I've been absolutely obsessed with is Thomas Aikens, and I've been obsessed with him for a number of years and have actually produced a body of work that was the beginning of a larger body of work um, that I'm still working on 
based on his work and his ideas. Uh, I look at him and Walt Whitman very much in the same lens, uh, being at the same period of time and being pioneers in thinking, in art, in poetry, and in um, actually the defining of uh, what it is to be a homosexual um, in this country. Um, right. Previous to these men in, in time, there was not a homosexual identity. And it only in the mid to late 1900s appeared. And in large part, I mean, we, we have to give big props to Whitman, who wrote one of the most profound series of poems that not only changed literature and poetry, and particularly gave America finally its voice um, in poetry, uh, and in so many other different ways, but also laid the groundwork that, you know, spoke to a lot of people and um, who really didn't find themselves in any other works of poetry except symbolically. And finally here it was laid out. And so I, I have been analyzing and rereading and reading backwards and looking at Aiken's work and looking at Whitman's work and what's going on in the studio now is kind of a synthesis of it, so. That's amazing. I can't wait to see what's next. But yeah, I mean, kind of, I'd love to bring it, bring us back to 2020. And, you know, I'd love to hear just like how, you know, we're in November now of this crazy year. And I'd love to hear from you. You know, I talk to all of our artists all the time. And um, how has this year changed or not? How has it influenced the way that you work in the studio, your studio practice? And um, Maybe a second question would be, how has it changed? Because as if people don't know, Ted is an educator. He te teaches at Plano West um, High School. And um, I know that things have changed a lot for you there too. So um, Very much. give me a little overview. I'm sure there's a lot to digest, but I'd love to hear how things have changed for you in the studio if they have. Well, it actually happened to me, 2020 started for me in 2019. Uh, because I lost both my parents that we cared for for many years in very quick succession. And um, I had a huge outpouring of creativity right after that happened that I totally dissociated as being connected to my parents passing. Mm. I had a major back surgery pretty much following that right. that kept me couch bound. And there was another great pouring of cre creativity out because, you know, that's the only place I could work. And a lot of work poured out of me at that time. And I realized I was processing a lot of stuff, but it was wildly creative. And there were about 50 pieces that came out of that time that I'm really proud of. And this is one of them. Um, and then when COVID hit, I'm an introvert, and so <laughs> art-wise, it wasn't a change for me. Um, I had a lot of artist friends and other friends going crazy, and I'm, I was sort of, you know, I was fine. I was, I was perking along and being quite creative. I had to drop my studio practice for a while from the summer on, because we had to figure out how to conduct school and open school in the fall, right. not really knowing what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I became, you know, obsessed with um, schedule planning, uh, communicating with faculty and administration. Um, I head up the entire fine arts department at West and it's, it's a big group of people, a, a great group of people, but you know, it encompasses, band, choir, orchestra, theater, speech, debate, music theory, and visual arts. Wow. And we're one of the largest programs and very fortunately staffed with a faculty that I think is better than a lot of universities have. Um, but coordinating that and getting that going, just I had to just put the work to the side and deal with that and then focus on my students as the year started and my department, and the work laid really dormant for a while. 
And when I tried to work on it, I really felt that I needed a slight break mm -hmm. because I was pulled in so many different directions. And so I was doing, a, I was doing a lot of cooking because that to me is, is one of my other passions. And I can come home from a very busy day and not necessarily want to head into the studio, but I do want to cook something because that's a creative act that has a beginning and an end. Absolutely. And, and an immediate idea of whether it was successful or not. And so it's only in the past month that the work has really taken off again in the studio. And it's taken off in really surprising areas because like I said, there are about five different things in the studio going on right now. There are drawings, there are maquettes for sculpture. There wow. is a hard drive of new work that I can't, I mean, I'm just letting it come out as it comes out and mm -hmm. figuring out what to do with it later. But in the past couple of weeks, I sort of feel like I'm back, that the mojo's finally back there. And I think part of it is just learning to navigate this new reality that right. we're all having to learn to navigate. You're right. having to learn how to do, run this from your house. I'm having to learn how to teach online and in person at the same time and deal with everything else and keep my studio practice going as well as our home life. And so I think that I'm just now, I've gotten what I would call my sea legs that I'm not teetering anymore. And mm -hmm. so I'm back, I'm back in there and I'm working on quite a few new things. That's exciting. And it sounds like you're, you're maybe working on a lot of different things, whether it is your formal studio practice or not. You're, to me, you're one of the people that has the most creative energy of like any artist that I know. I feel like you are always just like churning out amazing things, but it sounds like, like you said, you're drawing, you're making maquettes for sculpture. How, like, is that just kind of a way to release the energy and then it kind of maybe informs actual pieces that we might have in the gallery? Or is that something that you want to explore more seriously? I would say, Lately, it's been sort of like a sea change. And those things happen periodically in my, my art where really everything's be, being reevaluated, being not reevaluated, but realizing that I've come to the end of an idea, mm -hmm. but going directly into another or multiple ideas. And um, going back to artists that have influenced me enormously. I would say a person that I really admire their career of is David Bowie mm, yeah. because Bowie would follow an idea to its conclusion and then he'd strip it all down and rebuild it up again. And I've noticed that happen in my career, I would say maybe every decade where something shifts dramatically. And as mm -hmm. I said earlier, the idea stays the same, the basic, you know, ideas that have followed my work forever. But I see something changing radically that because of the political and the social environment has given me pause to be able to do. And there have been public commissions that I've recently completed. I completed that very large wall for uh, the Cypress Waters development, the tile wall, that really made me go start looking at things that I had just dropped. Right. And I do have a weird creative energy. I mean, I, it verges on manic, but I'm, I think I'm healthy enough to say it's not quite manic, but there are just too many ideas. And I think COVID has given me the permission to step back and really assess where I need to devote my energies to in the future. Mm -hmm. And in the past two weeks, as I've talked about earlier, I think it is, it's spoken to me and said, yeah, let, let's do this. So the sculpture ideas have been in my head for about 20 years. Really? Uh, the sketches had existed and then all of a sudden the maquettes started happening. And then all of a sudden I started working with a foundry and it's, it's coming together slower than it would in non-COVID times. Sure. But 
it's exciting to see that I can look back on what I've done in the previous 30 years and everything's starting to connect in a really interesting way. And so I'm, to quote another teacher, I'm, I'm riding the wave right now and just <laughs> seeing what happens. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that. Well, I guess a good final question to ask you is, and just to preface, I know this is not, this year is not something that's going to end on December 31st, 2020, with all of its crazy issues and pandemics and governmental failures, I hate to say it. Yes. Um, but what are you excited about in 2021 as kind of, I, I don't want to say fresh start, but what are you excited about for the next year? I mean, honestly, I have to say that I hope we've turned a corner in this nation. Um, I hope that we all get in a better environment mentally and as a nation. It's desperately needed. We're pretty Absolutely. much at a, at, a, at a point now where um, it either needs to get better or we need to start filing divorce papers. And I don't right. want that to happen. I mean, part of my fascination with exploring Aikens and Whitman and Cole and so many other American artists is realizing what about this nation I'm proud of. Mm. And with our many mistakes and our many flaws, that there have been good things that have happened. And especially in the art, there have been things that have been looked over in terms of art history that I think we need to re-examine in terms of our nation's contribution to art, I like going down this road. And it's incredibly unhip to a lot of other artists. But I think in a way, it's the most punk thing I can do. <laughs> I like going against the grain. Mm -hmm. I like embracing the idea of beauty. I like embracing the idea of making something that makes some people profoundly uncomfortable. Right. And change happens that way. And I realized that as a political activist, as a social activist and as an artist and as an educator, I'm in a very good position on multiple fronts to create change. And so now's the time to push forward in art and now's the time to create a new tomorrow. And now's the time to make people a little edgy, but in a good way this time. I we've, been through, we've been through a lot of edgy, so. A lot of edgy, that is an understatement. Well, I think that is such a positive way to look at things, uh, such a positive outlook that I think we all need right now. I certainly do. Um, and I think that's a perfect way to end it. So Ted, thank you so much for talking to me. I wish I was right next to you, but I know we will be together again one day, which I am super excited about. And um, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm so excited to see what's next from the studio for you. And thank you so much for talking to me. Thanks, Meredith. It's great to work with you. And it's also great to consider you a very good friend. So thank you. Ditto. Thanks, Ted. Bye, Take care. <laughs>